to the Love Your Story podcast. Today, I have a double treat for you. My interview with Tanya Don Terry is one that involves one hell of a story, but spoiler alert, it ends with a woman who has beautiful spiritual gifts of intuition and healing. This two-part series includes a story of living through a satanic ritual, five marriages and divorces, and a transformational path where she discovered how to listen to her higher power, how to face fear, how to pay the price for freedom, and how to uncover and use her spiritual gifts. Stay tuned for my interview with Tanya and the first episode in this series. Stories are our lives in language. Welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. I'm Lori Lee, and I'm excited for our future together of telling stories, evaluating our own stories, and lifting ourselves and others to greater places because of our control over our stories. This podcast is about empowerment and giving you, the listener, ideas to work with in making your stories work for you. Story power serves you best when you know how to use it. Tanya Don Terry brings a unique approach to personal transformation. She currently works as a transformation coach where she is known for her for her intuition in the healing arts, neurofeedback and life coaching. Tanya is an expert at guiding her clients through the chaos of change so they can transform their pain and fear into wisdom and courage. She is about maximizing freedom, joy, peace and abundance for living an ideal and authentic life. But all of this starts and stems from her story. Tanya, welcome to the Love Your Story podcast. Thank you so much, Lori. I'm so happy to have this conversation with you. Um, I'm so happy to um, hear this story and to have you share it because it's intense and beautiful and I only know parts and pieces, so I'm excited to to get into the depth of it. Thank you for sharing it. Mm -hmm. And I want to start with, who are you? That is a Good question. I would say the woman that I am right now today is one of resilience, uncommon strength, clarity of boundaries, and an ownership of my personal power. That's a good space to be in. (laughs) It's an awesome, (laughs) much earned space to be in. Right. Okay. So who were you before? Where, Where did this transition start? What was the catalyst? I would say the catalyst for me, I'm going to call it the great awakening. Okay. Is was in 2011 and I'm 50 years old right now. So, okay. You look great for 50. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Uh, So back in 2011, so I'd be in my forties and divorce number five. Uh, Okay. I just love that because I only have three. (laughs) That's the beautiful thing about having a messy life is some people, there's not many, many more people that can have more than the number five divorces. I knew someone was seven once. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. It's, You've still got a couple more to catch no, up. No, thank I'm you. Sorry. No, no, thank you. I'll, I'll, I'll close that loop. <laughs> okay. So how did we close that loop? Sorry to interrupt you. No, 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 no. That's okay. So it was my fifth divorce. I was married two months and... I'll just shorten it by saying I realized this was not going to be a healthy relationship or one I could stay in when an armchair was picked up and hurled at me. I thought, all right, here we go again. And how humiliating. Was it a pattern of abuse in your marriages? Yes. Most of the five marriages were abusive, physically speaking. Um, So... I was so humiliated. I mean, here people are gathering for the fifth time to support me in a relationship. And it tanked again. But you know what? I I knew going going forward, I knew he wasn't the healthiest or the best. And yet I still said yes. Why? Because I was the old version of myself. The old image of Tanya was I don't value myself. I need to prove my worth to you. Let me accommodate you. Let me play small for you. That's how I did relationship earlier. Okay, so how did you, where did that take you then? You're here, this armchair gets hurled at you. 
So needless to say, I left the relationship. And so now I'm alone again. And I drew a line in the sand. I go, this shit stops now. I just can't continue this level of heartache and reset one more time. Something happened, Lori, where like something broke open inside me. I was breaking apart, but at the same time, I broke open to the awareness of whatever it takes, whatever it takes, I'm cleaning this up and I can't do it by myself. So I turned to God, the divine power, and I had a walk and talk with God where I'd get up in the morning and I'd say, whatever it takes, I'm lost, show me, I'll do it. So walking and talking with God every morning for probably two weeks, show me. And he did. What, what did he show you? Oh my gosh, talk about putting stuff on the altar. This may not make sense to people, but it's not my job to have it make sense for them. This is my life. But what he asked of me, but what I what I did in the process was I I left my religion at the time. I was trying to fit into a space that wasn't working. So I, I pulled away from that. I pulled away from family and from friends. And what it take took was for me to have an eat, pray, love experience where I needed to travel into the journey of myself. And that took me away from everybody and everything I thought to be true. But I agreed, whatever it takes. Why did you need to be away from your family and your support system? I think what had to happen, I had to have a a cutoff, like a separation, because I was too enmeshed with people telling me who I was or wanting to please people. So my... I was, my default was um, governing my life to how it would fit for everybody else. So I can see the wisdom of God in saying, girl, you need to separate yourself. You need to go, I'm not gonna put you in a cave, but you need to go somewhere. You've never been, and guess what? He even told me, I say he, but the divine message came to me, you're going to Bend, Oregon. Never been there. I said, okay. And in two months, I moved there by myself, freaking my family out. And everybody that knew me, I had a thriving energy work practice at the time. I put the practice on hold and told everybody, I'm going on a sabbatical and I'm not sure when I'll be back or if I'll be back. And I left everything, Lori, everything. And went to Bend, Oregon. And... What did you find in Bend? Oh my gosh. Um... Let's just say I was freaking terrified. I arrived, so my, my mom and my dad helped me with the moving van. I arrived, moved into this small, simple apartment. The moment they left, I thought, holy shit, what did I just do? Um, I'm absolutely alone. And get this, so I'm the oldest of seven children. Then right from, right from sharing a room, sometimes a bed with a sibling, I went and went to college and shared room roommates then. Then I went from college to a marriage. I had never in my life been alone. So here I am, all alone, freaking terrified, and still saying, here I am, now what? Oh my gosh, so always, always growth and change comes from getting out of our comfort zone, right? I love the courage you're showing here because Um, Well, the openness, the humility, the humility to really talk to God, to the divine, to your creator and say, help, right? Help. And then to be wise enough to be persistent with that, right? And wise enough to listen and then wise enough to do despite the discomfort, despite out of the comfort zone, despite. So this is beautiful. This is a great, great example of the type of journeys, the, the call to action, really the call to action for you. We just, I just did a, um, an episode on the Herald, the things that come into our lives that present the call to action. So Gandalf showing up and saying to Bilbo, Hey, you know, we're going to, we're going to go on this adventure. Are you going to leave the Shire and come oh, along? Right. Yeah. So there are these spaces in our stories where there is a call to action and in a way your call to action, um, coming from God, really, but instigated and started by you saying, 
no more. I need help. And then listening for that call. And then the call comes and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm going, let's do this. Okay. So here you are, you're alone, you're afraid, but you're wanting this change. And what happens? So I arrive alone, not much money in the bank. And I thought, okay, my next step is to get a job. And uh, so I, I did, I, I sought employment and I got a, a job and ironically enough, you know, I don't know whether to share this now because it, he was kind, what I'm about ready to tell you was, was the gift of me showing up, the gift of me being brave. You will always be given something in your bravery. So I, I'm just introducing this main character in my life who is Joe Flora, who's my sweetheart. We've been together for five years. Yay. Yay. There's a happy ending. There is. There is. And, but he showed up in my life and, um, as a friend, I, I was really not, I was, my relationship first and foremost was going to be with myself. And so I, I, I met this man and he showed up and, and it was a friendship. It blossomed later, but, um, you know what really happened? So aside from this, this wonderful man who, who really introduced me to nature and boy, I granola it out. I mean, I let my hair go gray. I wasn't wearing makeup. I was a curly mess. It looked like I put my finger in the light socket. Just let my hair grow wild. And it was not I love it. my image. Did you have a VW bus? I could have, but <laughs> <laughs> I was driving a beater at the time. So this connection with nature, where did that take you? You know, that's where the healing really began. Yes, I was missing my family. Yes, I was I was trying to define and uncover and, and discover who am I. Um, so it was a tug of war of a lot of emotions. But what I was relishing in was the fact that I gave myself full permission to become somebody new. I didn't like where my life was going. My life wasn't feeling like my own. And I was ready to take it back. So I was going to find out for myself, what do I want? Who do I want to be? And what do I need to do? The, the part of nature, like I would canoe in these beautiful Oregon rivers and hike and just, I could just feel a healing, a physical, tangible healing happening. And this person, this Joe, um, who was my, my adventure buddy at the time, showed me all the great places to go see and explore. And, you know, I, I didn't have to turn that into anything for the first time. I could have a male friend not need to please him. I was uh, not putting on any mask, which was new for me in relationships. Like I wanted to, who doesn't want to show their best face, right? I just showed what was real. You know, I if it wasn't pretty, like I said, I, didn't, I wasn't wearing makeup. I was just in utter exploration with my adventure buddy and it was real and raw and I loved it. What a sense of freedom. You know, whenever you follow God, you most often you can't see where you're going. But as we see this unfold, already you see that he's taking you to this place where you didn't even need to know. You didn't even know you needed to be there in order for these things to happen. You didn't know that you needed, when you're in a place where nobody knows you, you actually can recreate whatever it is that you choose because there's not any preconceived um, conceptions Absolutely. going on. And so you could explore with who am I and what, is it, what do I want to be? And it doesn't matter to anybody else. And what does that look like? And so you really go to this clean slate place and you're able to start doing that. And love that you also are sent a, we call them in story archetype, a mentor. This is what it sounds like Joe was, where he comes. And by a mentor, it's not necessarily someone who is teaching you something. Sometimes they are just people that are there in the crossroads that show up to give you something that you need. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they just provide a gift. And in this space, he's providing a gift of companionship totally. and um, unconditional friendship, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that you can explore and be there, but not be totally alone while you're doing it. Yes. And what a gift yes. of, what a gift from your creator to put you on this path, right? To put you exactly where you needed to be with the cleanness to do this and then to provide you someone to walk with you so that you're not alone, but the right someone to walk with you so that it wasn't um, manipulative. You know, um, what's also interesting, 
very few people in their 40s can, can just leave and, and go explore themselves like I could. But here's the thing, I um, was never able to have children. And that was a deeply painful thing, especially you know, in the culture that I was, the large family that I was, I always had these deep desires for children. And that just never happened. So again, God will always take what we look as, uh, look, what looks like a lack of something or an absence of something. But later on in my life, the absence of children ironically gave me the freedom in my 40s to just take off. Not everybody gets that chance, mm. right? Totally. Yeah, good point. And, you know, I'm seeing God waits for an invitation. Because of our agency, he doesn't impose himself upon us. My invitation was, show me. Mm. And then he could intervene. Then he could show. But I, I really feel like probably previous to that, I was superficially having a relationship with the divine. In moments of deep despair, I would call out to him and it was always that hand that lifted me up. But there was something different about this call. It was a soul call that, that spoke to, my life is too painful to live like this one more day. Okay, so you open the invitation to God, you knock and he will show up. And then we're looking at um, the humility when you really mean that invitation, right? You have the humility to listen and to do that. You know, I'm, I'm walking through these steps so that we as listeners, when we get to those spaces can recreate those steps, right? Mm -hmm. Um, A sincere open invitation, sincere listening, a sincere willingness to act, to act. Yes. upon what you're given. Yes. And you will be asked. You will be asked to give up the very things you don't want to. You will be asked to let go of what you think is true because those are old paradigms. So if you're asking to be bigger and more expansive than you ever were before, if you're if you're asking for the truth, you've got to let go of that. It's it's not easy. It hurts like hell. But what I have come to find out, Lori, Whatever you're being asked to give up or let go of, two things happen. This is my experience. He either returned it to me and I now knew to appreciate it greater, or he replaced it with something even more magnificent. Those are the results of being willing to put it on the altar. You realize how much faith that takes? Tremendous. But that, but that the reward of that, Lori, is worth worth the risk if you believe that there will be that reward you don't know and that's what makes it so great right? you're right because you could lose everything yep. you have to be willing to though at some point when you're in a crutz of my life can't continue like this if you if you don't have that inner faith or utter ability to jump off the cliff or to give it all mm-hmm. I, I don't know that you can really end the cycle so tell me about your spirituality. Tell me about your connection with the divine. Um, when did you first start recognizing that? And what does that look like? What What are your spiritual gifts? Um, and how did that, where did they come from? How does it tie into this space in your story where you have the type of bravery? And I realize we're right in the middle of this, this story, but the, the backstory here of who you are from a spiritual standpoint. Um, Can you tell us that? Yes, I can. I, you know, as a child, I was, I've always, I'm I'm empathic and very intuitive. As a child, I, I just could always feel what people were feeling or what, know what they needed. I thought that was natural. I thought everybody knew that. Um, Not the case. But Again, going to the depths of some of the greatest pain I've ever experienced um, was a recollection, a memory that surfaced when I was uh, 26 or so, 25, 26. I, I had to deal with the recall of satanic and ritual and sexual abuse when I was five. Now I share that because as that as I came apart and literally undone 
in that process of having that surface, Mm -hmm. what happened? What were these gifts, these spiritual gifts that manifested that was the gift of healing through touch? Um, I was able to see with my physical eyes things that people normally don't see. So the deceased. Um, Wow. Yeah. So you've seen dead people. I do. I have. Yes. And I've, yes. (laughs) So that, that's a real thing. It is. And uh, nothing I asked for. I didn't ask for these gifts, but in, in the uncovering, in the healing process of recalling and living through the satanical ritual abuse, those gifts were, I don't know if they were given in that moment, but they manifested then. During this? During it. During the satanic? No, during the, the recall. So when I was five, that's when the abuse happened. Can you tell us a little about that? Not, not to bring up hard things, yeah. but what, what, does, what did that look like? What happened to you? Mm. So there was, uh, I came from a family member, a distant family member, <clears throat> not immediate family. And at the time, she is, by the way, now since committed suicide, because I can speak of this particular person. Um, this was one of my perpetrators, <clears throat> but uh, she was 16 years old. I was five. She had severe uh, mental uh, illness and was just returning home from a stint in the psych ward. And it just so happened that my father was being transferred and we were moving to uh, out of state, so we were staying with my father's parents. It was me and my two younger sisters and my mom. And my dad was off trying to get the family ready for the move. And my aunt, she just, was torturous. Uh, I, I, I don't want to to put into the minds how evil and dark that practice is. But it would be almost unbelievable to hear about it. I, I was tortured. I was sexually abused by more than one and a group type of a situation. I witnessed things that, to this day, I can't tell what was real and what really happened. Uh, I'm talking about sacrifices. Uh, As a five-year-old. As a five-year-old. So, you know, what I'm grateful for about the repression of that memory is I I really don't know that a five-year-old could have handled that. So I'm glad that there's a part of our brain that can lock away such trauma because at 26, it knocked my reality and me for a loop. I myself had a stint in psych ward. As that came surfacing, in my attempts to try to keep it from surfacing, which was part of the ritual, you they, they do things so that you don't recall. Um, there's lock gates or, or certain certain things that are meant so that you don't talk about it. Well, I started to recall it, and so here it's coming out, and I'm convulsing, and I'm not well, and I'm having panic attacks and nightmares, and just wanting to to harm myself in the process. So I was put in a psych ward, and I stayed there for about 10 days. And, uh, wow, I, I look back now, Lori, and go, how the hell did I get through that? How in the hell did I get through that? And I do have at least two memories of one, I was one of the tortures I recall, and I I think it's so beautifully symbolic. And you're thinking, how could somebody talk about satanical abuse as beautiful? And I, I don't mean it in that sense, but I mean it in the beauty in which God can take anything and make it a gift. So that's the beauty I speak of. But one of the tortures was to put me in a small box, confining and dark, and just leave me in there. Uh, a, a way that she was able to be powerful and manipulate me. Well, one time I think she must have put me in there too long because I, I recall in one of my memories waking up and looking up, up, up at two faces, my aunt and some other woman, 
and they were terrified. And I think what had happened is they probably thought they went too far and must have passed out in that process of uh, being in a confined box with little air and no, no light. That was my life, Lori. I stayed in that box, in the confinement, in the smallness, until 2011, when I said, this shit stops now. This trail of losing myself, of playing small, of fearing being seen, it makes sense now to me. Because when I was seen back then, I was severely harmed. I was fractured at a soul level from that experience. But I got to reclaim myself. And it took took a while, but I did it. Wow. So how and where did the spiritual gifts start to show up to support this? So I remember having one of the memories surface. And when that happened, I here's the thing about this. And I don't know if this applies to everybody, but it did for me. When I was recalling the abuse, it wasn't just the memory. My body was remembering. So I would have pains where I was harmed. And it was literally like reliving it as if it was happening right now. So I was in, I was laying in bed one night, one afternoon, and my body was in severe pain in, in areas where they were had harmed me. All of a sudden, I found that my arms began to move across my body or around the area that it was hurting. And I began to make these little, I don't know how to explain it, signs or symbols, or do, I was doing something with my fingers that looked like I was trying to make signs or symbols with my fingers. And I began just to allow my body, because I was exhausted and I was in pain, so I thought, I don't know what this is, but I'm just gonna allow my hands and my arms to do something that they seem to know what to do. And I'll be darned if I didn't feel better. I felt a, a relief, like it was pulling something away from me, and I calmed down. And I thought, what was that? And it happened again. And it happened again. And at the same time this was happening, what was also happening is down my arms were these rushing, tingly feeling. And like my arms were, if I were, I'd have to get up and just shake my hands. So that was part of what was happening at the same time the gifts were. And at that point, I didn't really care to analyze it too much. I was just grateful because wherever I put my hands, whatever I did to pull that out, it was working. And it gave me a respite where nothing else could. And then one time I just happened to kind of confide in somebody. I didn't know, I thought, this is really weird. And are they going to put me in a psych ward if I talk about this? So I kind of kept it to myself. But then a, some time had passed and I spoke to my mom about it. I go, mom, I do this with my hands or I put my hands here and the pain goes away. And I don't know why or how, but I seem to know what to do to help myself. And she, she thought that was interesting. Didn't know what to think about it either but she shared it with an aunt of mine who's, who later, for, for her interpretation, she said, you're doing Reiki. I'm like, what's that? So then I began a journey exploring the healing arts. And what did you find? I found that I intuitively already knew what they were trying to show me. And that sounds weird. So I have a, I'm a Reiki master, but I remember being in the class to be taught and I started doing that. She goes, how do you know that? I go, I don't know. She goes, that's great. Yeah. I don't, and Lori, how do, I don't know how to explain that to anybody, but I already knew this art that I was <laughs> experimenting oh, with. how weird is that? There's no explanation, there right? There is not. And then I bumped into, a, so, and then I studied with a Cherokee medicine woman for, for a time, and I, a Peruvian shaman was living in Salt Lake at the time, and she says, you have the gift. And I'm like, what? She goes, you're a master healer. And I, I didn't know what that was. She says, will you work on me? <laughs> what? Well, I don't know what I'm doing. She goes, you'll know. And I did. Really? Mm -hmm. So what did you do then? How did this translate into your life? <sighs> Lori, I trusted that I had a knowing that even if I didn't understand it, if I would just allow it to surface the knowing uh, and that looks like I know where to put my hands. I know what to say to somebody. I know to trust that I see something and to speak of it. If I didn't try to analyze it, like how do I know this, which halted it. But if I just allowed myself to be in authenticity and just show up, 
without agenda and trust what happened. Um, when I got myself out of the way, a natural healing experience occurred. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so how did you use it? How did you, you end up working with people? I, I, I was doing it just to gift people because I had this belief that if this is a spiritual gift, then I'm not to charge for it. I don't know if that's a truth, a religious truth based on where I was at or where that came, but that was my mindset. But at the same time, I was going through another divorce and um, needed a way to provide for myself. So a friend said, why don't you charge? Other healers are charging. Oh, I, 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 you know, I don't, I don't, I shouldn't, she goes, do it. Let me see some friends. Well, okay. So it started from that. And then it was word of mouth. I never hung a shingle. I didn't print business cards. Word of mouth spread. And before I knew it, I knew what to charge. Well, I just was told what to charge. So I, I set my fee and allowed it to be word of mouth that people were showing up. And I was, I was booked two months out, five days a week. Wow. Yeah. That doesn't happen very often, right? Yeah. People work really, really hard to establish that kind of Yeah. I didn't see business. that coming. I didn't see that coming. But as I was working on other people, healing them, it was helping me not be so focused on what I had to heal. Mm. And here's the thing. That's good. But it also was a deterrent for me. How? Because I got lost in helping other people in their healing process to avoid my own. Mm. And ironically enough, in my gift to help heal and support others in their journey, I was failing miserably in my own. So I had to discover what that was about. And I, I had some profound awarenesses when I was asking to see the truth of what do I do with this gift? Why is this here if I'm not to use it? I had to, to be taught a different mindset that I don't know is agreeable to too many people or that they can hear this in the way that I, I hope to relay it. It's, it's, a, it's an understanding that when I try to put it in, into language, it taints it, but I'll try my best. Okay. When I was formerly working as a healer and medical intuitive, I would see things and know things and because of that, I thought, okay, I'll go in and I'll heal that. I'm being shown that so I can heal it. Um, I, I mean, anything literally from a woman who had this growth in her that her doctor saw in an x-ray, she came to me, she didn't tell me, but I saw it. And she goes, yes, I just got that. I, they're, they're wanting to remove it, it might be cancerous. And I said, well, let me see what I can do. And I did my work and I didn't know what would be the outcome, but she went and she got an ultrasound again and it was gone. So that's that's not to puff myself up. I'm just saying the depth of which the skill and the healing energy that could occur. But here's the thing. So when I went into the journey of the eat, pray, love experience and was trying to define myself because I left my healing practice alone because I had sorely neglected healing my own life. And I'm in the process of now being taught what's the truth here. And part of the truth, which surprised me, was we have illnesses, diseases, traumas, dramas, as a form to teach us. And when somebody intervenes that before we capture the lesson from it, it does not serve. It's not truly healed. It will come back again for the person you think you're healing. And for the practitioner, you take that energy on because it must be processed somehow. And many, many energy and healers and intuitives will often knock themselves completely out of balance or get very ill themselves, which I myself, that happened, because we're processing that energy, that lesson meant for somebody else to process because it has to be balanced out somehow. So you could actually, you would be allowed, whoever, the universe, God, would allow you to take somebody's pain or illness even if it wasn't best for them? I don't know how to answer that. I just saw how I intercepted. There must be some sort of capacity where we can still be at free will. And in that free will and agency, 
we can intercept something that's meant for somebody to learn. So maybe it's more of God allowing me to intercede and intercept. Was I doing harm to somebody or was I healing them? Was that my place? I began instead of seeing, oh, I see this, I'm gonna heal this. And here's the thing, I really never came from the pride, like, look at who I am. I am not, um, it's not a Christ type of attribute I put on myself. I am not here to cleanse and pure the sins of other people. I'm not saying that in any way. It's not a God complex. I really genuinely thought I was there to serve, but I was taught otherwise that if, if I am to be a true channel for healing, I will wait and just be present. And it naturally happens now. I don't go after it. And I kind of have a, how do I say this? I have an agreement with my gifts. <laughs> Isn't that weird? I have an agreement with my gifts and the divine or even with myself. And that agreement is I will show up. I allow myself to be an open and pure channel for the divine. No other, you know, without agenda. Here's the disclaimer. Um, I don't want to see the deceased. I don't want to see the things that I'm not supposed to touch or to heal. I don't want to um, put myself in that. If I am to act upon it, let me know in that moment or let it happen. I'll, I'll be the hands, I'll be the voice. And I will say that since I've done that, I am now in balance. Uh, my gifts or my gifts are now more subtle. People don't know that I um, support and I'm a catalyst for healing because it doesn't look the way it did before. It's ever so subtle. But because of my agreement to stay in integrity with the divine law of what is theirs to learn and process through is theirs. That doesn't mean I'm a bystander that watches somebody struggle. That means maybe I struggle beside them. I give them hope. Or maybe there have still been moments, Lori, where I do make an intercession, where something I say or a touch or I do elicits a healing. But How often does that happen? Well, truthfully, because I dropped off the radar for six years and didn't allow myself to be in that space up until like the last year, I, I decided I'd step back up. So I don't know yet. Hmm. I don't know because I was selfish with my own repair and um, by that I mean, I wasn't in a space to serve anybody. I really had to fortify my own home. Thanks for tuning in to this first episode of this two-part interview series with Tanya Don Terry. Have you ever been so finished with a bad series in your life? so tired of the life that kept showing up for you that you were willing to say whatever it takes, whatever it takes to stop this, whatever it takes to change what keeps showing up for me. This story has a hero who is looking for the way out, has a number of heralds calling her out to make changes, and the hero steps forward with faith in a space of loneliness and fear to find her way through the maze of her undoing and rebuilding. I love her story of self-discovery because of her bravery, her action, her faith, and a spirit willing to listen and navigate. Tune in next week for an incredible discussion with Tanya about the process of healing and the rest of the story. As always, don't forget the Love Your Story podcast website, www.loveyourstorypodcast.com. This will give you access to all the past episodes, lots of good stuff. We have over 100 episodes now, crazy, and also access to the 21 Life Challenges program and the class for reframing your past stories that are holding you back. Use the website, people. It's a great source for you. We'll see you next week for some incredible discussion with Tanya that you won't want to miss. Mm-hmm.